Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I am so happy and grateful to have Gary with us today, who was born and grew into adulthood in a small town of Texas Gulf Coast, on the Texas Gulf Coast. He was blessed to be raised by an extraordinary father and loving mother, and he thought it was all so normal. However, he would eventually learn that far too many were deprived of the childhood they deserved. As a young man, he left, co he left college and went to live in the inner city of Brooklyn, New York. There he came face to face with the ravages of poverty and the crime, drugs, and violence that poverty begets. He observed the damage that ensues when children are deprived of the love and protection of a father. After 45 years of marriage and the raising of three amazing children, he would become convinced that he had the responsibility to share what he had been given with those who were denied a healthy relationship with the father. It is that thought that was the genesis of his writing and speaking career. In his writings, he seeks to share his rich life experiences for the benefit of everyone. The blessings of family, the experiences of life, and the hard times he has walked through have all blended to forge a perspective which he shares with his readers, his perspective that views the difficult seasons of life as positive transformative events. He has a passion to inspire authenticity in men, equip women and men with workable life skills, and enable a healthy culture of fatherhood. He's inspired to empower modern men to become respected, valued, and authentically masculine and to demonstrate how society will benefit when they do. Gary, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Jesse. Yeah, this is, you know, I'm really excited to talk with you because something you even said in your bio, and we were just chatting about this beforehand, about viewing, viewing difficult life seasons as transforming events. And as of the time of this recording, April 22nd of 2020, it's, it's a very difficult life season for many. We're right in the middle of the corona, COVID-19. Many of us around the world are sheltering in place, lockdown, quarantine. There's so many different terms. I don't know what to call it anymore. And there's a lot of economic uncertainty. There's a lot of, I guess, just uncertainty everywhere. Very difficult life season for some. How, how can those folks who are in this challenging time begin to embrace this time, not as a as necessarily a, a punishment or a, a prison sentence, but rather a, embrace it as a, a transformative opportunity? So uh, first, I think we need to figure out how we're going to go through it. So tip number one, turn off the TV. Hmm. You know, the, the national governments, the state governments, they're going to work through all this. You know, the, the epidemiologists, they're going to work through all this. And regardless of what the predictions are, uh, we're, going, we're going to go through this like we're going to go through it. And, and the reality is there's not much, I think we're all learning, but there's not much we can do about the circumstances we're presented with, but there is something about how we can respond. And our response uh, is like a personal sovereignty. You know, it's like we have, we have a sovereign control over our heart, our mind, our thoughts, our response. And that much more than anything that happens in the economy or the government decisions, that one fact has much more to do with how you're gonna come through this. So the question is, are we gonna come through this battered and beaten and beaten down with a, bat, with a, with a a future that doesn't look like anything like we wanted it to be? Or are we going to come through this as individuals better equipped for our future, for a better future, with a better, better concept of our purpose and a better concept of who we are as people, what our core values are, all those things. Some of us, it's a free country, right? We get to choose in this, in this country. We get to choose which of those realities we want to embrace. Mm. It's kind of like we're going to brand ourselves. I was talking to my son, I have a deep, my middle child's a really deep thinker. He's also smarter than the rest of us but together, but uh, he's doing this personal branding thing where he's developing his brand. So what our, our brand is how we see ourselves and how we think of ourselves. There's going to be phenomenal opportunity coming out of this. There's going to be opportunities. If you, if you want to start a business, the day to start a business is not over. The day to start a business is just beginning. And I'm a small business person. But the there's going to be phenomenal opportunities for, if you want to be a personal coach, you want to start a business, what you, you want to influence people. The phenomenal opportunities will come out of this if we will walk through these times determined to face whatever comes our way. 
Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I love the notion of a personal brand because I, I find that a lot of times people will spend so much time obsessing over what's going on in the external world and they completely ignore what's going on in the internal world. Mm-hmm. And they brand the external world as chaotic, stressful, you know, they're angry, they're upset, whatever that is. And then instead of taking that ownership of how they want to brand themselves and experience it, it it's almost like they just become this, this, you know, dust in the wind where they're going wherever the wind blows them with no regard for where they really want to, they want to set down and who they want to become during this time. You know, that, that speaks directly to what our core value or to understanding what our core values are. You know, I was, I was raised by a very extraordinary guy. He was, uh, he was born in that in December of 1924 and, uh, don't do the math. Yes, I'm old. Don't do the math, but he, uh, he, uh, at a very young age, younger than two was stricken with polio. His right leg was totally paralyzed. And the doctor said he'll never crawl or walk or yada, yada. Any, there was a whole list. It, was his, it became his bucket list. His bucket list was, our bucket list is I want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro or I want to go to Tuscany. His bucket list was I want to crawl and walk and play with my friends. That wow. was his list. And so the doctors just said, said to him, we need to put braces on his leg. He'll never, he'll never walk. And my grandparents, uh, who were pretty two strong well people raised in farm, farms and ranches in central Texas, they just looked at the doctor and said, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, and the doctor says, <laughs> you know, what do you mean? No, I'm not. Wow. He said, you're not putting braces on his legs. And, and they said, he said, why not? I said, because he's going to learn to walk. He said, how are you going to do that? He said, they said, we'll see to it. Now, let, let me translate. That's kind of an old term. It's no farming community term. We'll see to it. What it meant was they, <laughs> they didn't have a clue. Wow. We, just like today, we don't have a clue. So the parallels between his life and how he walked through this, we don't have a clue to walk through the house, walk through this either. But they just said, we'll see to it. Which meant whatever we have to do to see that boy walk, that boy is going to walk. It was an, it was unadulterated, unabashed statement of pure will. And he walked because of their will, willed him to walk. And they took him home and they could have made one or two decisions. Well, they're going to treat him like a poor little handicapped kid, which he could have become easily. Are we going to, are we going to, to not pamper him, not feel sorry for him, make, make him be who he needs to be. It was because of them that he became who he needed to be. Interestingly enough, he was the one in the family that should have been the one everybody had to take care of. When they grew up to adulthood, I was raised in a small town, a small church, but when he grew into adulthood, he was the guy that everybody came to for help. Hmm. Wow. He defined his reality, like we said, he defined his brand. I'm the non handicapped kid. <laughs> My daughter and I were driving through the, the, the uh, parking lot of Walmart back when she was a young teenager. And I said, you see that handicap space right there, Rachel? And she said, yeah. He goes, you know, if your granddad was around, they tried to give him a handicap sticker. He'd say, no, give, give it to somebody who needs it. Because he didn't see himself as handicapped. Hmm. He saw himself as an overcomer and he had two basic principles. Whatever, whatever challenge comes at me, I'm going to take on that challenge. I'm not going to turn away from it. And once I engage, I'm not going to disengage until I've, I've conquered it. And he just kept on and on, no matter what. I saw it growing up. You know, can't was not something that was allowed in my wow. vocabulary. So it was just, it was, it was amazing. There's no medical reason that he could have walked. He learned to use his right leg, which was totally paralyzed as a crutch. He would just swing it from the hip 
and lock, he got to lock his knee and step onto it like a crutch. It didn't make any difference what it was. He was going to figure out how to do with one good leg what everybody else was doing with two good legs. It was just, I, this is what I am going to be, and this is what I am going to do. And I saw that every single day of my life, which, which explains some of the weirdness about me. But <laughs> Terry, what do you, what do you think that was in him? I mean, was it was it just he he developed because of his parents or grandparents? Did he develop? Did he develop like a an innate belief that he could? Was it that he just it was it was just this decision he made every day where there was no other alternative or possibility other than he was going to walk, he was going to figure this out. What, what is it? Because I think there's such an important point here I want people to get. I, I, I think most people fail to achieve whatever it is they want, whether it's a successful business, happiness, a, a fulfilling a meaningful relationship, better health. I think they fail to achieve it in here way before they ever fail to achieve it outside externally they'll blame circumstances but really i think what happens is there's a shutdown a disconnect in here and maybe they never even believed they could in the first place so it's a basic it's really a very basic simple decision jesse am i going to let my circumstances determine who i am and what i have and what i become hmm. or am i going to decide what i am who i am and what i'm going to become that that's really is is what it is because there are people that, you know, you look back through history, there are people who were born into phenomenal wealth who became absolutely bankrupt. And there were people that were born into the most oppressive environments in the world who became multimillionaires. It's all about, it's all about how we see ourselves, what our core values are. And I think the thing that really, there were some things that really drove him he had, he developed this strong ethic that said, these are my standards and this is what I'm going to live by. I think he used his physical condition where he had to say, this is my standard. I'm going to walk. This is my standard. And mm -hmm. I'm going to live by that no matter what circumstances come. And that developed in him a whole set of core beliefs that, uh, that he just wouldn't violate because if he knew, he knew if he, if he ever started something or if he ever came up against a challenge and he backed away, he knew it'd be easy, too much easier to do it the second time. He knew it would destroy him. I think he mm. instinctively knew that. You know, it's like when we go to the gym and we're working out, you know, you first start going and you're working a personal trainer and you're doing real well and you're enthusiastic. And then one day you, you get a little bit tired of it. So you, you do three sets of 10 rather than four sets of 10, which makes it easier the week after that to do two sets of 10. Yeah. Right. He never, he, he just had a, a, he never would let himself back away from anything. Hmm. It was incredible. <laughs> it's an incredible life of watching somebody overcome the impossible every day of your life. Gary, I want to dive into this a little bit because I, I'm loving this. And I think that, so I'll preface this by saying that I think that one of the biggest, I don't know if the calamities is the right word that's befallen modern day society is, it seems like much of our narrative has become one of almost, let's reinforce the woe is me and that we can't, mm -hmm. instead of empowering people to, with the mentality of your father, we almost coddle to the, the unfortunate hand they were dealt and use that as it's more of like a, there, there, it's okay. It's not your fault as opposed to let's figure out how we can lift you up from that. So for the, the modern person who's listening to this and is hearing this story and they say, well, okay, I hear you, but you know, my situation's different. I, I can't help what happened. I, I can't help. It was a different time you know, maybe it's, it's this generation, part of what's going on now is our generation is a victim of having generations like your grandparents and your parents who were so resolute and whatever we decide we're going to do, we're going to get done to make life better for everyone else. Now our lives are so blessed that, you know, the things that we have, we've been able to have the luxury of, of almost shelving that mentality maybe. 
if that's the case, how do we get that mentality back? Like how does the modern person today really embrace that, especially when there's so much noise out there telling them that it's okay to, you know, it's not your fault that you're in this situation, that other people should try to fix it, that you can't help the circumstances you're in. Well, I think this virus is going to help us in that, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, this is not, I mean, it's, it's a bad thing. People are dying. I mean, I mean, seriously, you know, those poor people in New York crammed in those apartments. Absolutely. Uh, but this is not, a, not entirely a bad thing. The reason we're like that, in my opinion, uh, is that we've not gone through a really, really difficult time in a very long time. I mean, we've been in a war since 2001, almost 20 years now, that nobody except for a few soldiers and their, and their families have had to make one single sacrifice for. Hmm. So we're kind of a victim of our own, uh, of our own success. We also, um, we also have, um, we've also developed a concept that we need to protect our kids from anything bad, including failing arithmetic tests because two plus two really isn't six. You know, two plus two is four, right? You know, it's not okay, it's not okay that you just tried. I think that a, a very key Thing, thing that needs to happen is that men in this country need to step up and take their place as men again. You know, men, mothers are good nurturers. I can see it in my family. You know, my daughter has certain things she calls my mother, my wife about, and certain things she calls me. Mothers are great worship uh, nurturers. Men are better at boundaries and, you know, let, let, you know, so, you know, a kid falls off of a, there's a little kid out in front of our house. He has this little, all the kids are playing in the street and they got this little cart he rides around on. And he was on the hood and one of the other kids were, was driving it and stepped on the brake. He fell off and he skinned his head. And my wife said, oh, you know, he, she was really heartbroken that he skinned his head. My response is, good. Much better, you know, a man's response is, good. It's much better to learn that that lesson when you're four and you're going one tenth of a mile an hour than it is when you're 16 and you're going 70 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So I think men need to start stepping up and stepping into the full measure of their manhood and start to reassert themselves in the family. The family's better off when you do. I mean, there's scientific, there's research. Uh, a friend of mine who's a, uh, a hu has a PhD in human development found a, uh, an article for me the other day that, that showed that me, back, through, back through history, societies where men were very involved in the raising of the children, very involved in physically carrying a child, and very involved in teaching that child, both the children and the mother thrive in that environment and we've been systematically trying to drive the men out of this, our homes in this country for way too many years and that needs to reverse men need to get back in the homes and ladies you need to accept them back in the homes and and you need to step up and, and understand no matter what the 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 current theory of the day is <clears throat> Masculinity is not an inherently evil thing. Masculinity is an inherently good thing. And so men are going to need to stand up and they're going to, they're going to need to demonstrate to their children and to this country what, it like, what it's like to go through a hard time, what it's like to, to, to set your course and stay on course. Men are going to have to step up. And there's some great, great fathers out there. I see them in my neighborhood, particularly last month, walking with their children and playing with their children. There's some great fathers out. So if you don't know what a good father looks like, there's one around that can show you. you know? but I, th I think that's going to really be key to this whole, whole situation. I, I just want to make sure you get an understanding. So it sounds like, too, for, 
for what you're saying here is for men to really step up and emerge because I think for men, there's, I think men are very confused in a lot of ways. I think that men are traditionally raised in this, mm -hmm, you know, me, man, like, you know, got to be overly macho sports is how I bond and, and grunting and sweating and those kinds of things. I'm supposed <laughs> to win and conquer. But then I also think that men are struggling with this, this, you know, I have to go and provide and be gone. And, and, and then in America, we value things like crushing it and grinding and pushing it in an entrepreneurial space. And, but then there's also men have these, these deep emotions and it almost conflicts with the ideals that maybe they're raised in or they thought they were supposed to believe. And what I'm hearing from you is that to really almost emerge as a man, it's not going and grunting and sweating and competing more but it sounds like it's being more present. It's being more, uh, more present and involved in your children, in your community, in your home. It's, it's setting an example as opposed to, it's doing what your, your grandparents did with your father, right? Was deciding on what the outcome was gonna be and there was no, and there's no other alternative versus recoiling into fear, which a lot may be doing right now you know, maybe numbing themselves with alcohol or just sleep or whatever it is, but it's really emerging and deciding what the path is going to be for your family and then focusing on that single outcome and then leading the family or co-leading it with the, with your partner or whatever that is to get there without accepting anything as an alternative. Would that be fair to say? Jesse, that's so good. I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> I'll send you the recording and then you can use it. Can, can I, do I need to, I'll, uh, I'll give you a footnote. Yeah, yeah. Add it no, to I think book. that, you know, there's nothing wrong with grunting and sweating in <laughs> athletics, right? Uh, I think that could be a tight uh, chapter, Gary, grunting and sweating. Nothing wrong with grunting and sweating. <laughs> nothing wrong. Maybe I'll write another book. Nothing wrong with grunting and sweating you know, by Gary and Jesse. <laughs> we can write a book together. Yeah. You know, the, the true strength of a man is, is an inner strength. My father was not a physically imposing guy. He's got one leg, mm. <laughs> you know, but he, we, we had a, I had an uncle who was a, an alcoholic and he was very violent with his wife. And when that would happen, uh, my dad would go over there and he'd calm him down. This guy could have taken my dad out, but he didn't. But why? He didn't because he respected him. So it's inner strength. When I was a child, I, we grew up on the Texas Gulf Coast and we, we do hurricanes. <laughs> Y'all don't do hurricanes in California. No, no. <laughs> we, do, we do hurricanes. And my hometown is about five feet above sea level and about five oh, miles wow. from the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> so we learned, you know, when there was a hurricane in the Gulf, but there was never one single time that that frightened me because I knew that my dad would know exactly what to do and he would take care of us. Hmm. It's really not, and I say that to say this, it's really not so much about what you say and you teach, it's who you are. It's when your children can look at you as a father and say, you know, this will be okay. My dad has this. I knew he knew what to do. He was going to have us out of harm's way. He was going to, you know, all that. And I knew no matter what happened to the house in the storm, he was going to provide. Hmm. I had a supreme confidence that he was going to protect me. He was going to provide for me and he was going to persevere with me. And it wasn't what he taught. It wasn't what he said. It was, it's who he was. Hmm. So that inner strength, which comes out of your core values of what is, what is important, what are those values that you will not violate no matter what comes? Developing those values within you and an inner strength within you that makes you into the person that your children can depend on, that your wife can depend on. That... I mean, that's what, and, and, and then understanding men and women have different roles. I'm a biologist by training and I'm going to tell my, at the risk of, at the risk of offending the ladies out there, 
you can't do everything a man can do as well as a man can do it. Mm. There are things men do better than women and there are things women do better than men. So in the, in the book I wrote, I just kind of made up a kind of a, a scenario of a family is out, uh, they're attacked by an assailant. What is the mother's first response? Now I'm married to a great mother. So all she ever wanted to be was a great mother and she succeeded. She's very successful being a great mother. So I know what a good mother's supposed to do. So in that circumstance, I'll tell you what my wife would do. She said, where's my children? She'd grab, she, she would, she would pull her children into her and she would put herself between them and the, and the danger. That was her form of bravery and courage. What a man will tend to do in, in, in the, when, when his masculinity is properly expressed, what a man will do is he will turn toward the assailant and go and confront the assailant. Hmm. Now, both of those roles are incredibly important in a family. They go together. You're talking about together and a partner. Absolutely, we need a partner. I don't make a, I don't make a mother any better than Martha makes a father. Hmm. She's a great father and a mother, and I'm kind of a okay dad. But you know, we you, we need to understand and embrace our roles as men, as protectors and providers, as people who can be who persevere and can be depended upon. You said something there, Gary, that I really resonated with. That this true strength of the man is his inner strength. And as someone who I, I've I've struggled with that my whole younger life, where. I never felt I was physically strong. And because of that, I always deemed myself weak. Mm -hmm. Much of my identity issues and self-loathing and I was, was a feeling that I, I tried to take my life when I was about eight, nine years old because I felt like I was responsible for my parents' hardships and that I wasn't strong enough to fix things, to make things better. I carried that burden my entire childhood. And when I got into fitness and started exercising, I took it to the extreme of thinking that I needed to be the strongest, the biggest guy in the gym, all those types of things. And then even when I got to that point why I started to feel a little bit better about myself, I still had this, you know, this constant conflict with myself where it felt like I was almost trying to cover up or mask who I was inside because the core emotions that I felt felt so weak as I was taught in the grunting, sweating kind of culture, right? And now I had gotten myself yeah. built up where I could grunt and sweat harder than anyone, <laughs> <laughs> but I was still not able to express. And what I'm really hearing from you, and, and just with the last minute maybe that you, we have here, is that inner strength it really, it forms from having an alignment of core values, right? A, a clear understanding of what those are and being uncompromising. And I think that I think there's a couple dynamics of people right now where there's some who have an acute awareness of what core values may be, but they may not be consciously practicing them. I think there are some that are, that are very aware of them and, and are practicing them religiously. And I think there might be some who have never even considered core values because they're so conditioned to allow the external world to operate and control their internal. With the last minute or so that we have, could you just touch on like how one may go about discovering or deciding on what their core values are? So I think you need to find yourself a very quiet place early in the morning. Uh, I think early in the morning is a better time than late in the evening because in late in the evening you have all the thoughts of the day. But when you kind of, when you sleep overnight, for, you kind of empty your mind. So um, I, I like to get up about 4.30 or 5. <laughs> but sit down in a quiet place with your notebook um, and different, you know, different religious traditions have different ways of expressing this, but just sit down and just do some thinking about what's important to you. Now, what may be, if you lost something, what would that be? Hmm. Do some thinking about what's important to you. It, it's not that those core values aren't there. They're just not recognized. Those core values are there. I particularly pay attention when I, th I start thinking about a time when I interrupt acted with people and I did something I'm ashamed of. That to me is a, is a, is a um, and there's more of those than I'm, 
I would like to admit, but uh, when I do something that years later, I still remember being ashamed of for doing, that's a, mm. that's a, that's a light into your soul that you validate one of your core values. And then you just, and, and this becomes kind of a journey, you know, it's not, okay, I'm gonna do this tomorrow. And it's, I mean, it's a journey through life. Look at times when you were stressed. You know, I went through the uh, the housing crash in 2009 as a small volume custom home builder. The rest of the country was in a recession. Home builders went on full long depression. Right? Look at I, you know, and I, I think back at, at that time in my life, and that's why I think maybe this time may be valuable because it gives us this opportunity. As I look back in that time in my life, what things did I do well and what things did I not do well? Hmm. and uh what what were the what were the thing what were the attitudes and the actions i took that had a good outcome or a bad outcome hmm. and that's also a good light into your soul so but just comes by spending some time alone and quietly and just thinking you know our mind we don't use very much of our mind and uh you know, all, all, all that you need to be to accomplish all that you are meant, you're created to accomplish is in you. There's no one, Jesse, there, 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 we each have a destiny and a purpose and there's no one disqualified from the purpose. I don't care how bad your upbringing was. I don't care what your circumstances were. I don't care what mistakes you've made. Everything you need to accomplish that purpose is in you. you just, we just need to go find it. Yeah. And that's, and I think the difficult times of life like we're going through now is a good time to go do that. We have time. We don't have to drive to work. You know, that saves about two hours a day. You know, you know what I mean? We have time. Now's the time just for quiet reflection. A good, a good cup of coffee didn't work or, or either <laughs> at 4 30 in the morning. But, but I think that's, that's how I came to write the book. 4.31 Saturday morning, I sat down and reviewed my life. Huh. And then I decided to write a book, which is really a crazy thing. <laughs> but I think that's the answer to it. Hey, that was that's, my, that's my answer anyway. No, that's, that's perfect. Everyone, you're going to want to rewatch, re-listen, and take notes. I, I love the, the bow that Gary just put on this about no one is disqualified from their purpose. Whether there are so many gems and pearls of wisdom here you can pull from, whether it's considering the 1920s mentality of a, a young boy stricken with polio. And consider this, that time there wasn't the medicine, there wasn't the understanding, there wasn't the books, there wasn't WebMD to Google stuff. <laughs> and the, the psychology of two parents making the decision that this, this boy was going to figure out, he was not going to be defined by his disability, but rather he was going to define it and define his life carrying it on to considering like how, where, where's the true strength of a man, not so much in his external, but his internal, that everyone has the ability to go within and to look and to get quiet and to review your life and ask yourself, what did you do well? What did you not do so well? And form and understand your core values from that to make a decision about how you're going to go show up during the seasons of life, because it's often during our most trying times that we figure out and really can step into becoming who we are whether that's the next evolution of our purpose or fully embracing what our purpose is. The opportunities are there right now. As Gary said, there's going to be so many opportunities that are going to come from this time. And that's not to make small or not acknowledge the hardships and difficulties people are going through. Some of those are very real. And recognize that external circumstances do not have to define your internal experience. right? And that's something so powerful and so important to remember. And I love how Gary spoke to that on different levels, whether it was from childhood or being a father or from just being a human being. We can all go within. We can all look to understand our core values. We can all make a decision now about deciding who we want to be, how we want to show up, and who we want to wake up as tomorrow. Gary, this was absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. We appreciate you. You've been an absolute blessing to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Absolutely. We'll see you next time, everybody, on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye. <laughs>